Darl, uh, it's great to uh, have you here and uh, chatting uh, about uh, the problems in personal injury today, uh, Mighty uh, and the consumer business it uh, recently launched a couple months ago, and also the future of personal injury. Um, before uh, we get into the meat, uh, I just wanted to say thank you to you uh, because uh, there were a number of uh, PI lawyers um, all around the country who have uh, offered critiques about the mighty model and, and some of the um, marketing that we've been doing. Uh, but none of them were willing to accept invitations by me to, to, to speak. And I think it says a lot about you uh, that you are willing to do that and you're willing to sit down and have constructive conversation uh, and so I uh, applaud you for that. Thank you for that. And I'm looking forward to, to chatting. Um, I do want to get into the meat, but I guess maybe before we do that, I, I have a question for you on, on this topic, which is like, why do you think uh, there isn't kind of more dialogue in the industry about uh, some of the topics that uh, you know, we're going to be talking about today uh, over the last decade since you've been in PI? Well, I, I think there's certainly a lot of room for improvement in, in the industry. I think one of the things as we'll talk about today, you know, I don't know that Mighty has accurately identified all, you know, the problems that do exist. Um, and I, I think the ones that it has identified, I'm not sure that it's going to be able to fully address those. Um, you know, th from the personal injury perspective, I think on the whole, the industry does a great job and I think does a really um, outstanding job of giving great representation to clients. Could it be better? Yes. I mean, no industry is perfect. There's bad doctors, there's bad people in finance, there's um, bad people in, in any industry. And so I think it's important though, you know, as we talk about these issues, you know, to identify, um, you know, bad practices where they exist, but to also, you know, avoid painting with too broad of a brush and kind of lumping everybody into, um, into one group. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's uh, really fair, and I am really excited to chat with you more specifically about some of the issues that we've brought up and that that you that you, that that, you, that you're mentioning. I think just to just to set the record straight, I have a lot of friends, uh, even close friends, um, who are personal injury lawyers, and uh, I certainly don't think uh, the vast majority of personal injury lawyers uh, are bad people um, or aren't good lawyers. Uh, but what I do believe, uh, and I think where I have consistently painted a broad brush, uh, is that the incentives um, of the industry are actually quite bad. Um, and we'll get into that more, but maybe I wanted to set the stage uh, for how this conversation came about. Mm -hmm. um, I have been posting uh, videos uh, to YouTube and to TikTok um, and to other platforms um, which are targeted towards consumers and, and uh, give consumers my perspective um, on opportunities for them to get uh, a better deal from, for example, their personal injury lawyer. And in one of those videos, uh, you uh, heard a, a sentence uh, or, or two that uh, you disagreed with. Um, and you went on to LinkedIn um, and, and I thought wrote a, a thoughtful message about that disagreement. Um, and in my opinion, it went viral. I mean, it got uh, so many more comments and likes than the posts that you had been uh, writing over the past few weeks. Um, and uh, I, I left a comment saying, hey, would you like to discuss this? And, and you did. Uh, and you said, yeah, let's, let's do that. So I wanted to kind of just tell everyone a little bit of, of how we got here today. Um, and so if it's OK with you, I'd love to maybe talk about that issue and we can use that as a jumping off point. Sure. So um, I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, so this was the post that, uh, that uh, we were talking about and um, br broadly uh, you wrote a case that settles for $2 million, sorry, I, I apologize. Uh, the sentence from uh, my video was a case that settles for $2 million doesn't take 10 times the work as a case that settles for 200,000 
So lawyers shouldn't be make so sh lawyers shouldn't make ten times the fee. Before we go into that, I wanted to make sure that the right context was sent was set uh, because there was actually one sentence that followed that uh, that I think is really important context for that quote, um, and I want to just play it really quickly. It's going to take uh, six seconds. Sense a lawyer's rate should go down and down as the case value goes up and up. That's because a $2 million case doesn't take 10 times the work as a $200,000 case, and that lawyer shouldn't be paid 10 times as much. And knowing that is your key to negotiating. So, and knowing that is the key to negotiating. So what the video was actually about was I wanted to give consumers advice about how to negotiate uh, with their personal injury lawyer in order to get their fee down. And one of the insights that I had uh, was that uh, personal injury lawyers um, uh, make more money on larger cases than smaller cases. Said differently, larger cases are more profitable than smaller cases. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is something I knew as an insider of personal injury. And so if a client has a more profitable case, uh, it gives them more room and autonomy to then go and negotiate because the lawyer is more incentivized to negotiate because it's already a, 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 a profitable case, uh, more so than, than other cases. You actually, I think, focused on a specific example of a case that you had and you got an initial offer of around $2 million and you were able mm -hmm. to increase it to, to $17 million. Um, and you And so uh, I wasn't trying to say that on one given case, uh, the work to get to 200,000 isn't 10 times, isn't one tenth of a case uh, of, uh, of the work it takes to get to a two million case. I was just talking about in broad generalities. Sure. And, and so I guess the question I have for you is just to kick this off. Do you think that large cases are typically more profitable for personal injury firms? And if you do agree, believe that, do you think that consumers should be negotiating more with personal injury lawyers when they have them? Sure. So I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. I mean, like a lot of things, it's not going to be something that can easily be answered with, you know, a soundbite. I think, you know, when we look at a case that comes in, first of all, we don't know when a case comes in, if it's a $2 million case, you know, the person could be, it could be a, a fatal car wreck. And we don't know if there's going to be 25,000 in coverage, 100,000, a million or more. Um, you know, the Marta case that I settled for $17 million is a good example. You know, my client was an, empl uh, an employee of a contractor, but that naturally raises potential exclusive remedy defenses under the Workers' Compensation Act. And those were not an issue for the first uh, two years of the litigation. And so the more that we pushed to maximize the value of the case, you know, additional lawyers came into the case. At one point, I was dealing with six law firms on the other side um, and, and my risk went up, too. So, you know, I would sort of push back on the idea that that when something happens right away, that they immediately know what it's worth. You, you know, I, I just think that in the vast majority of cases, we just don't know. So that's one thing. Second of all, you know, and I understand your point where this the last part of the video said that's your key to negotiating. But I think that's sort of the overall problem and the overall critique that I've had of, of Mighty's business model and the messaging is there's a significant difference between cost and value. And something that's a cheaper cost doesn't necessarily add more value to the client. And I think that's ex especially true in the personal injury world. Um, I've seen it time and time again. And so I think it, one, I don't think it's a service to clients to, to tell them, well, the case may not take as much work when actually it does. Because then if somebody comes in and has watched your video and I have to talk to them about it and they'll say, well, I watched Josh's video and he said, your, my case isn't going to take 10 times the work. I'm going to have to say, well, it's actually a little more complicated than that. Um, and I'm not doing that to be greedy. I'm doing it because I'm trying to be transparent and trying to give them the full honest truth about their case, number one. Um, but number two, I do think it can be um, a disservice to clients to shop their case around. I think it's important to interview lawyers and to gather as much information as possible to make an informed decision. I absolutely agree with that. But sometimes the cheaper option is not the best option. And in fact, I would say the vast majority of time, in my experience, the cheaper option is not the best option. And so what I've seen is 
you know, if a if a client could go to an experienced lawyer who has all the work that they need for, you know, they do catastrophic injury cases and they're extremely selective on the case cases that they want. And they charge just a flat 40 percent, whether it settles pre-suit, whether it goes to litigation, whether it goes all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Is the client going to be better off with them or with a law firm that maybe doesn't specialize in that kind of case and has a lot of bandwidth because they don't have as much work? And the reason maybe they don't have as much work is because maybe they're not as good as this other lawyer. And so they're willing to cut their fee to 25% or 30% or a third. If the client's making their decision based solely on that, they're making a huge mistake, in my opinion. And so what they really need to be looking at is value over cost. Um, I will say, you know, I have had cases where people ask me, you know, from the beginning, will you uh, charge less for your fee? And there are some times we make exceptions. I think one of the things that I noticed is my litigation rate's actually cheaper than Mighty's. Um, I charge one third for litigation on motor vehicle collisions. Mine does not go up. Um, and I'm happy to explain my rationale for that later because it is, it is a client focused reason. Um, but you know, there's a lot of things we do on the back end if a case doesn't pan out. Um, if maybe there's limited insurance coverage, but our client doesn't have you know, enough liability insurance to pay everything. And, and we can yeah. give examples as we talk about this uh, today during our discussion where I've taken almost nothing on the fee in particular cases to make sure the client got something. And medical providers who've treated on a lien have been willing to do surgeries for clients, even when they know they're not going to get paid back because they know the client could have a devastating um, outcome if they don't do the surgery, yeah. who have taken pennies on the dollar because of that. Um, and we do those things on the back end. I just think on the front end, it's very difficult to make promises to clients without knowing what is going to be involved in the case. And so yes. the way I approach it is I like to have the flexibility on the back end to do those things. And, you know, again, I would point out, I, I know there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, PI lawyers and, and being, uh, you know, having misaligned incentives. And I think we, we may disagree to disagree about uh, how maybe some of those comments are interpreted. Um, but I will say this, the vast majority of personal injury lawyers I know want to do the right thing by their clients. They're not motivated, you know, solely by money and they're not out there just trying to get rich off their client. They're really trying to get a great outcome for the client. And so, you know, I know that's a long explanation for, for your question, but I, it does require a, a, a lot of unpacking to kind of go through, you know, my rationale for why I do things the way I do, the way, you know, other firms do it. Yeah. So, so I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think broadly uh, talking about price uh, is, is, is important. And so I'd love to get a little bit more nuance. Um, your, your, your point was you don't know what a case is going to look like when it first comes in, whether it's going to be a $25,000 policy or a $2 million policy or an unlimited policy. I, I generally agree with that uh, entirely. Uh, that's why my video actually gave the advice to the, to the consumer of not negotiate the fee no matter what. It was negotiate the fee so that your, the price you pay goes down as the cost, uh, as the settlement value goes up. So if you do find that it's a $2 million policy, or in your case, an $18 million policy, uh, the client has pre-negotiated uh, those reductions and they don't have to just rely on the charity of a personal injury lawyer. You might, at the end of a case, do the right thing. But most lawyers uh, follow their incentives. And incentives are an incredibly powerful uh, uh, concept. Charlie Munger has this very famous quote um, that you know people's incentives guide his entire investment strategy. Um, show me some of these incentives, um, and I'll and I'll show you their actions, or I'll show you their outcomes. So. If somebody has, just to kind of go back to the original LinkedIn post, uh, if somebody uh, in fact has bigger and bigger cases, why shouldn't they negotiate their, their fee on a, on a scaled basis uh, in order to uh, make sure that the lawyer isn't making windfalls on cases that uh, might be worth uh, millions and millions of dollars of fees? Sure. So I, I think one is the original point that I made about, 
you know, the best lawyers aren't necessarily negotiating their fees. I mean, if you look at any industry, there's people who have rates and, the, and that's their rate and it's take it or leave it. And it, with some kind of wiggle room, but it, what, what, to me, what, it, but, but, but what, what, why is that out of curiosity? So um, if, it, it has to do with bandwidth. It has to do with time. I mean, there's only so many hours in the day. We can't take every case. And so, you know, lawyers, especially the ones that work on the biggest cases are extremely selective about the cases. So, they so, take. So, so, so we should back up here. Um, and because I think you said something really important, which lawyers who work on the biggest cases. So, so just so we can get some like statistics for people who aren't as familiar with personal injury. Um, according to our data, 75% of cases settle for less than $30,000. Um, the vast majority of cases never have a lawsuit filed. And less than 1% of cases, well less than 1% of cases go to trial. So I want to also make sure we're not overly generalizing. Um, because in, in fact, uh, I think what where, where this conversation is veering is towards like only talking about big cases, but we're, we're I think we ought not to generalize because there's the vast majority of cases aren't those big cases. Well, I think part of the reason we're talking is Mighty has generalized a lot. And, and that's been the perception among personal injury lawyers is that there's been some generalizations made about the industry. Um, it's certainly, it, it, you know, to your point, to the points in the articles created um, some backlash and, and happy to talk about that too later today, because I think some of, I think the backlash has more to do with the tone of the conversation and the statements being made than it does with Mighty's business model. And, and again, we'll, we'll have plenty of time to unpack that. But, you know, from my point of view, um, it's one of my core values is that we're empathetic and client focused. You know, we are 100 percent driven towards the, the client's interest. And so, of course, we want the client to get the best possible net result in their pocket. But there's sort of that that initial thing I said, which is I don't think it necessarily benefits clients to be shopping around for cost why? cases because why? it becomes a race to the bottom. But this, to the second point. So, so, so your, 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 your premise is that a lawyer that reduces their fee or a lawyer that's less expensive is, isn't as good. Is no, that no, no, not always. What I'm saying is you don't want the client to have the perception that they need to be bargain shopping their case like they're looking for a pair of tennis shoes. Why? You know, that, like, that's a criticism I have of, of one of the challenges in the personal interest in, injury world today. But let me get to the next point about this, because the next point I wanted to make is this. The original point about, well, the the two, getting from 200 to 2000 doesn't take 10x the work. Getting the additional value above a certain amount is the most is the hardest part of a case. But you're, 90 but, plus but percent again, of you're, time. I think you're doing what you did in the LinkedIn, which is you're comparing one case and getting additional value out of it. I'm comparing two two. Uh, of the exact same cases side by side. One has a $200,000 policy. One has a $2 million policy. The one that has a $2 million policy uh, does not take 10 times the work as the one that has a $200,000 policy. And my, my example is, is, is the example that is uh, far more prevalent than what you're describing and certainly what I meant in the video. I, I would disagree. I mean, I've got a lot of colleagues that represent clients in catastrophic cases. And when when you're dealing with... Do, do, do you think a personal injury lawyer would rather take big cases or small cases? Honestly, it depends, on, it, honestly it depends on who you ask, because there are some firms that run a business model where they just want volume. They want they want high volume of low value cases. Yeah, they, Maybe they, they're they, not they, equipped to handle it. But let, let me get to my... I just want to get to this point really quick. Sure. Because I think, you know, we're talking about generalizations and I can give an example over here. You can give an example over here. My whole point is you don't know at the beginning of the case what it's going to involve. So you don't know if it's going to be a two million dollar. But, but, but is that a rationale for overcharging the client? It's not overcharging the client. And that's a, a false assumption that you're making is that it is overcharging the client. It's not overcharging the client. It's a flat percentage. Yeah, it doesn't but, go up. It doesn't go down. My fee doesn't go up if a client's case goes into litigation. Yours does. So, well, 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 let, I mean, sorry, let, let, let's, let's unpack this. When you charge a flat fee for something, uh, you will make uh, less money on some clients. You might even lose money on some clients. Um, and you will make a windfall um, on other clients. Inherently, that is uh, not pro-consumer. In, an, in a perfect world, uh, lawyers would charge for the work that they do. And creating broad rates for cases um, is actually anti-consumer 
Um, and I think the, the defense that you don't know initially um, is an excuse, it's a cop out because what it ends up resulting in is some clients paying a windfall. And one of the things that we've recognized in our decade in personal injury um, is that the, bigger, the biggest cases result in the largest windfall. And as a company that is pro-consumer, I made the video in order to help people who have those windfall type cases to know how to negotiate them more. And so I think from, from our perspective, when we hear a personal injury lawyer say, well, our prices are fair, despite them not having changed or gone down in decades, despite nobody competing on price, despite no one displaying their prices on their website, it seems, it, at least from the outside, seems very self-serving. So well, I guess like, how do, you, how do you explain how PI pricing is the same despite it actually not changing across firms and across cases? First of all, you're wrong when saying it's, it's the same. It's not the same. I don't charge the same as you do. You charge more than I do for litigation of motor vehicle accidents. Well, I, I, but by the way, we, we can unpack that in a minute. I don't, I don't think that's true. But, but, you charge 36%. But we also give, uh, the, so M Mighty Law, so, so let me just actually step back. Um, Mighty, uh, who, where I am the CEO and founder, um, is a service company, and a technology company. Um, and uh, we have uh, affiliated with a, a law firm called Mighty Law uh, that uh, has its own lawyers, is independently owned. There's no common ownership between the entities. Uh, and Mighty Law abides uh, to a code of conduct. One of the things that Mighty Law does um, in addition to having uh, a lower rate than most uh, people that go to litigation, maybe not you in this case, is on top of that, it has, uh, it shares in some of the medical costs, the case costs and the financing costs to actually reduce the fee even lower. Which I, I think may actually be a violation of bar rules. It's not, but in addition to that, and we can talk about that later. So the but, 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 but let me just finish. In addition to that, it has what? Uh, I, su I suggested in the video, which is that as the case value goes up, uh, Mighty Law's fees go down and down. So had Mighty Law uh, actually tried the $17 million case, the amount of contingency it would have gotten um, on the vast majority of it would have only been 10%. Um, so it's hard to say that your litigation rate is less expensive than Mighty's because Mighty's is more thoughtful and multifaceted which is I think the exact argument I'm making, which is that having a set fee uh, doesn't actually serve consumers in the majority of cases because everyone's cases are different, which was your point to the begin with. I just have a very different solution, which is not, let's just say that a set fee is fair for everybody, but instead let's be more thoughtful and say, this sort of case with this sort of facts should be charged this thing. Um, and this other case with the other set of facts should be charged this other thing. And once we can create more specific pricing, I think that will be fairer for consumers. So a couple of things, you, you brought up the $17 million case. Mighty Law wouldn't have gotten $17 million on that case. And that's just the, the truth of it. I mean, as, as so, far so, as I can- So, so, so we can unpack that uh, in a minute, because I, I think a lot of the premise of what you're describing, which I want to talk to you more about, um, is that there's these amazing lawyers um, like you who get these outcomes that no one else can possibly get. And I want to dig into that more. But let's I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is Mighty Law isn't the answer. What I'm saying is my view of Mighty Law's business model is it's going to be a settlement mill on steroids. But let me come back to the point about the fees. You said that they don't advertise their fees and all fees are the same. That's not true. There's a guy on the radio in Atlanta who says he charges 25% across the board. For every case. Now, if I've got a catastrophic injury case or a serious injury case or anything, are they going to get the same level of service with that guy as, as at another law firm? And again, I'm not saying I'm the only one. Yeah. Are they going to get the same end result? And so you know? we're, we're talking about negotiating our but, fee. But, 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 but wait, how, how do you know that? How do I know what? That the guy who charges 25% is not going to give the same service quality as you. Well, first of all, uh, again, I'm not going to name names, and yeah, go don't, in, don't, you know, don't but names. I've, I've been exclusively practicing law for or personal injury law for 12 years. I've seen plenty of cases that get undersettled. I have people who call me after cases have been settled by certain law firms. 
who got bad results. I've yeah. talked to people about cases and they say, hey, I think my case is worth this. I've had cases that other lawyers have handled where their initial demand is five hundred thousand dollars, and I get over a million. So, these, are, these are the problems we're tackling. But how, what does this have to do with price? Because this is what, this, this segment is about price. What, what this has to do with price, price is you're you're asking the consumer when they're making a buying decision to focus on price instead of value. But where's that's the bottom the line? And let me, let me finish. Lawyers giving worse outcomes. Why why is that lawyer charging twenty five percent or lawyers who charge less or lawyers who agree to less? Why does that mean they're going to be um, get less uh, less good settlements or, or have worse settlement outcomes than the lawyers who don't negotiate on their price. Let, let me finish my point. My point, again, is that not all lawyers charge the same, okay? I charge less than some of the, quote, billboard lawyers that you've attacked that, that may charge 40% for a pre-lit. There's, there's lawyers in Atlanta who will charge 40% for a pre-suit car wreck case totally. and 45% for a litigation case. And I think that's too high. I think there's a balance. But my point is this, you're asking people to negotiate rates on the front end when you have, and, and to individually tailor it. Because that's what you said. We can't make yeah. these generalizations. That's right. It's impossible to individually tailor it because I, I have been doing this for 12 years. And there's cases that I thought would be easy that have been some of the hardest cases and required the most work ever. And I've had cases that I thought would be super hard that turn out to be super easy. I mean, take a premises liability case, which Mighty advertises is going to be but, handling but, slip and fall cases. But, but, but when but I get a call, let me finish, Josh. When I get a call on a slip and fall case, I have absolutely no idea what the strength of that case is going to be. I have absolutely no idea what type of defense they're going to put up or they're going to be spoliation issues. So why not go to an hourly rate that's on contingency? What's that? Why not go to an hourly rate that's on contingency if that's what... Because uh, clients can't afford an hourly rate. That's no, why they pay a contingency. And contingency, that's you know, we're talking about hourly rate that's deferred until the case settles. Because the whole reason that clients get charged a contingency rate is because it is not based on the time. It's based on the result, number one. But you're it's describing, based on the risk. But you're describing, you're, you're basically, your excuse for not being able to understand what a client should be charged up front all goes to time. You described some cases taking longer, uh, being harder than others. And I think that that is uh, not the right way of looking at well, it. Well, let me back up. I think if anybody reads my LinkedIn post, I had two criticisms of, of your comment. First of all, a bigger case does frequently take far more work. I think there are some misconceptions um, that, that you, maybe the lawyers, I don't know, have about cases and how long they take. The vast majority of cases to get maximum value take a significant amount of work, number one. But my second point in that same post was contingency fees are not based off of an hourly rate and the amount of work. Your point, I was addressing your point where you said fees should go down because the amount of work doesn't increase linear. And so my point was, well, many times it does. Many times it does. Does it always? No, many times it does. But, you know, when we talk about misaligned incentives, and that's been kind of the theme, and I listened to your WABE interview uh, yesterday, there's this talk about misaligned incentives. And it, to me, my incentive is to get the client the, the best possible result for two reasons. One, that is how the contingency fee is calculated. But two, my entire business and the vast majority of my business is based off of, of other people's business is based off of doing high quality legal work. Are there lawyers out there that will burn a bridge and do something that may not be advantageous for a client on, on a particular case? Yes, but that exists in any industry. The vast majority of people I know want to do right by the client because they're playing the long game. They're looking at this as I'm going to get, you know, I want word of mouth. I don't want to screw over this client and, and get bad reviews or have them, you know, not refer cases to me in the future. So, you know, I, I, would also disagree with the idea that there's somehow these misaligned incentives, you know, in the industry. Um, and, you know, I, right. I, I did take offense to it when, you know, she was, you know, you were asked, are you saying that all personal injury lawyers are bad people? And you're like, you didn't say, well, not all of them are engaged in bad practices. You said, well, they're not bad people. They just have misaligned incentives. Like, which is, which is what I said at the top of the show as well. Right, right. Which is, we are actually screwing over our clients, according to you. Um, we're just not sharp enough to notice that we're doing it. And that I think is a, is a huge problem. There are 
thousands of dedicated lawyers in this state of course what I but, do. but 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 they're, but, 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 they're playing, but they're playing in a system where the incentives of the lawyer are misaligned with the incentives of the client and you just brought up a great example uh there's this notion that uh personal injury lawyers try and put forth which is absolutely positively not true that because you get paid off of the settlement uh, as a percentage that all of a sudden all of your interests are perfectly aligned with the client and what the lawyers don't explain to the clients or to the general public is that you get paid off of the gross settlement but the client gets the net settlement and there are a lot of misincentives and bad incentives uh, that arise because you don't actually care as much because your fee isn't tied to it of what the client ends up netting because you're getting paid off the top. And so one of the bad practices you want, you talked about, uh, um, uh, th there are a lot of uh, firms, uh, there, there's, a, there's a large firm in, in Georgia that has a policy to send all of its clients to get MRIs. And the, the even ones that uh, the doctor isn't actually saying is medically justified. Uh, and the economics for the lawyers are simple. The clients who go and get an MRI that find nothing, uh, those clients bear that cost of the MRI it comes out of their settlement. Uh, the lawyer doesn't lose anything or gain anything. The clients who get an MRI where something is discovered, uh, those cases are worth more um, and the lawyer makes more money. Um, I think that's a terrible, terrible practice. I think that people should get MRIs only when the doctor thinks that they're medically justified. Um, but yet you have a, a lawyers who are pushing uh, for every client to get them um, as a matter of course. So I think that there are tons of those examples uh, of how the incentive misalignment between the gross settlement and the net settlement, what the lawyer makes its money on versus what the client actually gets in the case. I mean, we can go through all those, but um, I think the, the, the larger point is that if you think that your incentives are perfectly aligned with the clients, I, I think you're, you're mistaken. Well, I, I would disagree with you. Um, I think in getting to the lawyer who is sending his clients for MRIs, which by the way, we don't do, we do not steer our clients to certain doctors. If look, if we have a client and I had a post on LinkedIn about this a few weeks ago, you may have seen it, um, you know, where I was saying the practice of sending every client to treat on a lien if they have health insurance, isn't the best practice for the client. Um, and and so getting back to your point, though, about, you know, the, the misalignment but, but, of that but, attorney. But, but you agree that a lot of personal injury lawyers do that. Well, I don't think a lot of personal injury attorneys do that at all. I think some of them do. And I think it's a bad practice if they're involved in directing treatment that a doctor has said is not medically necessary. I mean, a doctor's ultimately got to do it. I mean, but why do you think they do that? Those those I, those lawyers. I have no idea why they do it. I would think of course that, we know why they do it. They do, they do it because it increases the value of the settlement and increases their fees. You know that. Well, what I'm talking about is I have no idea why they do it on particular cases. I, I don't know any lawyers but that you, do you, them on. Wait, sorry, but you do know. It's for the reason I just said. No, no, no. What I'm saying is I don't know lawyers that do it as a blanket. You just said there's a law firm in Georgia that sends every single client to get MRIs. That is news to me. Okay. But, 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 I, but, but, but even let me get back cases. to your point. But even in particular cases, that's bad too. Whether, whether it's a blanket policy or done in, on, in, in particular cases, it, it's all bad. Well, let me get back to your point. Your point was the attorney is doing it to increase the value of the case. The incentive is still like, how well, is taking a fee- The client has to pay the bill. The lawyer doesn't. The, 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 the old so by you paying 10% of the MRI cost, if an MRI is you know, $3,000 by yes. you paying- yeah, by you writing reducing law your, is paying, is, is, is reimbursing- so, so let's talk about incentives. Wait, Josh, wait. Let, me, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example on the incentive. Okay, if an MRI is, let's say 2,500 bucks, okay? I think I saw one the other day. That's about what it was for a lumbar MRI. And you're going to pay 10% of that. That's $250. If the lawyer thinks, if, if he's driven solely by money, as you're saying, that that's all that he's focusing on is just what's in his best interest, not the client. If he thinks it's going to increase the value of the case more than $250, he's still going to do it. It's not going to change his behavior. My point is this. So, so there just, are going just to restate what you just said. Can, can I just finish my point really quick? Sure. My, my point is this. There are bad actors in, in any industry that may have bad motivations. My only point was, I don't think that what you're talking about is going to fix that. It's not going to change the incentives because like I just said, that modest adjustment and them sharing in that medical expense, if it's permissible, 
isn't going to change their behavior because they're thinking if I'm getting this MRI, it's increasing the value of the case far more than $250, far more than $2,500. So if the lawyer's doing it because they think it's going to increase the settlement value, that's also the net. I can tell you when I have clients who get medical treatment that is medically necessary because my clients are only getting treatment that's been recommended by a doctor, um, that increases their case value far more than just the medical cost. So the client does benefit from that. And so if we're talking about incentives, is there going to be a disincentive for your folks to not send people who might need certain treatment because you've got to share in the cost? When we talk about case expenses, your firm shares 10% of the cost of the case expenses. That case that settled for $17 million, I had almost $300,000 in case expenses in my out of pocket. I did focus groups. I did all sorts of stuff. I never once had to think in my mind, oh gosh, I'm going to have to pay 30 grand of this at the end of the day. You're, so if, if all of us as professionals who have fiduciary obligations to our clients, who had to, to pass a character and fitness test to get admitted, who had to take the rules of or the multi-state professional responsibility exam, who are governed by rules of professional conduct, if all of us are driven solely by money, then there's going to be problems inherent in, in your model and your incentive structure too. And, and that's my point is I don't think everybody's motivated exclusively by their own self-interest. If people are doing certain things, uh, even if I disagree with it, a lot of time, it, it's like you said, it is to, because they think it is in the client's best interest to maximize the value of their case. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think one important point that I think you made is just to restate, uh, we both acknowledge uh, that there is uh, bad behavior amongst personal about some personal injury lawyers. We we uh, disagree on the scope of it. On the scope, but there, there's bad practice on on some. You think it's an isolated case. I think it's much more aligned as, and associated with a larger incentive problem. One of the ways that Mighty is going about uh, fixing it is that all Mighty Law uh, employees agree, uh, all Mighty Law lawyers agree to a code of conduct. And one of the things in that code of conduct is to refund, um, uh, is to share in 10% of the costs of that lumbar fusion on lien uh, with their clients in order to make sure that that bad incentive of sending their client to overtreat uh, is lessened. Your point is, oh, well, that alone is not going to solve it. And I agree with you. I think that the bad incentives of PI need to be uh, solved through multifaceted channels. I think one of them is as simple as talking about it. Um, and having conversations like this, where we actually can openly talk about the bad practices. Um, but another is actually disclosure. So it's uh, telling people, uh, clients, um, about these bad incentives, educating them, uh, allowing them to understand that the treatment that they get increases the amount the lawyer gets, uh, so that they can take that recommendation or referral with a grain of salt. I think it uh, helps to tell people that the treatment they get actually needs to get paid for out of their settlement. The number one complaint we hear when we interview uh, 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 consumers after they settle their case is they had no idea how little of their settlement they'd actually get. And uh, another practice um, is to stop accepting gifts uh, from, uh, from doctors. Uh, I see all the time personal injury lawyers who have uh, these charities that they're fundraising for. And who are the top donors of the charities? The big local medical providers. Uh, I know there's practices uh, of Braves games uh, and uh, sports, uh, sports tickets. So there's a bunch of these practices and that mighty law lawyers in the code of conduct agree never to take gifts, uh, agree to strict disclosures. So it's not just the 10% uh, that realigns the incentives. It has to be multifaceted. I also just want to point out that mighty law, you're right, it, it, even in itself is not, is not perfect. Um, it will have its own set of incentives. And I think the mighty law lawyers are excited uh, to continue adding more and more codes to its 13, currently 13 codes of conduct in order to further ensure that the misaligned incentives um, are, aren't uh, hindering uh, their, their, their judgment. But no one else is doing anything. And... Uh, so the fact that Mighty Law is, and all of a sudden you have all of this criticism heaped on it and, and us because we're trying to start these conversations. I mean, it seems incredibly self-serving 
for an industry that hasn't changed its price in decades, that hasn't uh, changed its uh, practices or lives by a shared code um, other than some minimal standard that the bar, the bar sets. Um, and so, I don't know, I, on one hand, I understand the, the pushback, but on the other hand, it's just so self-serving when Mighty wants to do things that will result in personal injury lawyers' lives being a little bit harder and them making less money for everyone to cry, to cry foul. Josh, let, let, let me, first of all, I think you've misrepresented the outrage that you've gotten and where it's coming from. You know, you, you went on WABE and said, well, and you even tweeted, well, we're, we're getting all this backlash just because we're trying to do the right thing. That's not why you're getting backlash. You're getting backlash, one, because you came in and dumped on everybody and said everybody's doing things improper and we're all bad and you're continuing to do it today. And second of all, Mighty built relationships with people in the industry and has software that allows it to have access to personal injury firms' data of their clients. And personal injury firms are genuinely concerned about not only has Mighty Law had access to my data, my client data. Mighty, may, law, has, Mighty law has never. But, well, but let, let me ask you this then, Josh. Why on WABE when the, the interviewer asked you, well, Josh, you're a personal injury attorney. Well, I'm not a personal injury lawyer, but I have lots of experience from creating software. You used your insider knowledge of software and for the sure. data that you've sure. seen as yeah. a basis for giving you expertise and you're doing it today. Well, when we talk yes. about people, yeah, when that, they that, have that, their that, cases that is, resolved. That is, that is absolutely true. I have seen a million cases uh, travel through our software and so many of the bad practices that I'm describing are not only as a result of that experience and talking to thousands of personal injury lawyers who are customers, hearing from uh, the experiences of medical providers and, 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 and consumers, I have a unique uh, visibility into that. We don't use anyone's data individualized. Everything that uh, I've seen uh, is on an aggregated basis. We don't share data. Mighty Law has no access to data whatsoever. Um, but let, but let but, me ask you this. Do you understand the perception, though, that if you have a, a business that what, what, has what, your data what, and, what, and has what, sensitive what, client what, data... What, what case and, management system do you use? I use Filevine. Do you know that Filevine is owned by a large law firm in Arizona? Yes, I am aware and, of that. And, and, and Litify, uh, which is a second most popular case management system, is I owned by I use Litify. But let, let me get back to my point about, because I think it's important to address this. You, you've repeatedly said that the pushback that you're getting from the industry is based because you're doing things different. There's people that do things different in our industry. And, and I think it's important. I do think, and, and maybe you have altruistic motives and you're not backed by venture capital money or hedge fund money, and you're not trying to do this to make we, money. We, we, are, maybe, we, are, we are venture capital backed. Well, there you go. So you're acting like you have altruistic motives and you're backed by venture no, capital. I, 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 we, are not, we are not a not-for-profit. Uh, no, okay, so let me, let me unpack that. Let me unpack that. So but, 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 but let me just say one thing that might give you more fuel. We are not a not-for-profit and nor do we claim to be. But I believe very strongly uh, that you can create new business models and spaces that create uh, large, important, profitable companies, which is what we aspire to be, while still looking out for the consumer and giving them a better deal than what the existing industry uh, offers. Josh, Airbnb, you're not giving them a better Airbnb deal. He has done it in, in hotels. Uber has done it in taxis. There's so many industries uh, that have evolved and result in lower prices for consumers, better service quality and depth, more transparency. That is what we are trying to do. Josh, Josh, we're not talking about a taxi ride. We're not talking about a hotel. Have you ever personally represented a personal injury client? What is what does that have to do with anything? Because you're acting like you're the industry expert. And my point is this: you, what you, 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 seen... just, you just said yourself that I've had access to uh, thousands of personal injury lawyers across the country, millions of cases. I am a personal injury expert. It might not be because I've stepped into a courtroom, but it's because I've analyzed and seen all of these cases and all of the bad practices. Do um, you know how many that, of my cases and, you've and, seen? And, and, and that perspective is you so know, much more important than somebody who's worked at their own firm do, and do just you, seen the inside of, of their own no, 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 no. You, courtrooms. You, you have seen a sliver of a sliver of a piece of a much larger pie. You know how many of my cases you've seen? Probably zero. I had never heard of Mighty until you came out. You know how many colleagues of mine had never heard of Mighty? You have made your money and your business in the pre-settlement loan and medical funding industry. 
where if there are any bad practices, that's where it's going to exist. Mighty still loans capital to pre-settlement loan companies and medical funding companies. Some of these funding companies that you're probably going to be sending your people to. When I'm researching Mighty, I find in 2018 that you raised over $100 million from George Soros' venture capital fund to provide capital supply for pre-settlement loans. Do you know that's one of the most abused practices in our industry is, a, is, a, is an area where you flooded the market with money and created incentives for people to borrow it? And the argument I get from people like you and others in the pre-settlement loan industry is, well, we have to have the rates high because of the risk. It's just too much. But the article's talking about how George Soros is getting 20% returns and there's no risk. And people that are being interviewed are talking about that. So I'm here. I've never heard of Mighty. My clients haven't used Mighty. I get a case. I have a client who has a pre-settlement loan. I'm negotiating it with a company that's got capital from your company. And I'm not able to get them the money they need in their pocket because you're enriching people like George Soros. I think that's a problem. So, and to then act like you come in and, and are the, the personal injury police and everybody's doing everything wrong and I'm the one to solve it. I alone can solve it. I'm the problem solver. I've seen everything. It's just not true. I have never heard of Mighty before this came out. You have never seen a single one of my cases. You don't know how I do business. You don't know how the vast majority of my colleagues do business. You have seen a sliver of a sliver of a very large pie. And that's my point is even if you've seen that, it doesn't make you an expert. I handle medical malpractice cases. Do you know how many patients I try to treat for medical problems? Zero. Do I go around talking about what's pr what the problems are in the medical community and how people are you know, dying and, and these bad practices? No, because I didn't go to medical school and I'm not a medical expert. I take each individual case based on its facts and I try to pursue that case in the context, but I don't hold myself out as a doctor. You're holding yourself out as a personal injury lawyer because you've had exposure to this small piece of the industry. And that's the problem that I see. Yeah. So um, you don't have to have gone to the moon to study the stars. Uh, people uh, from all walks of life uh, have not only changed industries, but improved consumer experiences, not because they themselves have walked in the shoes of the people that they're of an industry they're trying to change. Uh, but because they have a deeper understanding, usually on a macro level, that allows them to have a unique insight. And I'll tell you my insight. And my insight is from a decade of being in personal injury. You're right in a lot of different aspects and facets. Although I think your attempts to sully me uh, and, uh, and the industries that I'm in are uh, an attempt to kind of say, look over here, don't criticize me. But let me get, but let me get back. It's to not, by the way, it's but, not. But, but, but let me get back ahead. in a second. The, the, the unique insight that I've had um, is that despite technology innovation through companies like Mighty and Filevine, which you use and, and Litify, uh, despite uh, it being easier to uh, figure out what happens in a car accident through self-driving car technology, cameras and cameras and cars and streets, cases are getting easier to bring, but yet personal, but, but listen, uh, but yet personal injury prices haven't decreased at all. Every other industry, as technology and innovation uh, comes in and makes an industry more efficient, prices go down, people compete. There is no functioning competition in personal injury. And do you know how I know that? Is because every billboard in the Atlanta area, and I've studied them, we tried to put our own up, but we, but we got rejected, uh, criticizing and critiquing the, the other billboards, um, every single uh, personal injury ad simply tries to uh, say that they're tougher and stronger uh, than, than, than the next guy. Uh, they talk about the big gross settlements, which are highly misleading because as we talked about, their clients only get the net. Um, and what people don't actually, uh, what people don't actually talk about um, is whether they actually are uh, good lawyers by the fact of talking about how much their clients get. Uh, they don't actually disclose important information that people need to, uh, that the consumers need in, in, to make informed decisions. I, I, I guess one thing to return to that I have a question for you um, is you, a lot of your premise, uh, at least the, what I uh, understand it to be, uh, is focused on this idea that uh, who your lawyer is matters so much that you should disregard price. Uh, because you're going to get, if you disregard price, you're going to, you're getting all this quality and, and that's what you should really be focusing on, which I personally think is smoke and mirrors. 
But I guess the question for you is, um, what, 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 how do you know if you're, if you're work, like what would your advice be for a consumer uh, of how they know whether they're working with a good personal injury lawyer uh, and what should they look for? And what are like the, the, the qualities and characteristics that um, make you think that somebody is going to get the right settlement amount for their client? And a related question is why do you think the mighty law lawyers don't have that? Sure. So I, I want to address this point because it is intertwined with what I'm about to say. So you've, you said on WAB, you said here today that personal injury cases are getting easier and easier to bring. I think on WABE, the actual quote I wrote down was they're getting easier and easier to resolve. That is 100% false. 100% false. If you ask any personal injury lawyer who has any experience actually not being a settlement mill, actually getting their clients real results, it's gotten harder. There's an attorney who's in my building that rents space for me. He's been a, he's a mediator. He's also a practicing personal injury lawyer with over 30 years of experience. He laughed when he heard that quote. He's been practicing for 30 years and it's gotten harder. So, so when so, you say those things, it leads me and my colleagues to believe mighty law is a settlement mill. And so that's what gets to what is a good personal injury lawyer. A good personal injury lawyer is one that knows one, that it's not about just sending a quick settlement and uh, demand and shuffling some papers around and trying to get a quick result for the client. It's actually having a lawyer who has experience in Georgia personal injury cases. You know, when I looked at the Mighty Law uh, attorneys' backgrounds on the website, the one that's a managing attorney is in Connecticut. She's not here. She 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 has experience in in Georgia cases, and she's not okay. Here. So it says time. she has ten years of personal injury experience. That's what it says. Okay, I pulled up her LinkedIn profile. She doesn't got ten years of personal injury experience. She spent three years. She's been only been an attorney for eleven years. She's been practicing commercial real estate for three years. She did so mass. Instead, instead of attacking specific lawyers, I'm asking you for- I'm giving for, examples for, of- but, 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 but I'm asking, but you're, you're attacking a specific person. I'm you're asking, asking for, me how for, to find a good lawyer and I'm, I'm using this as an example. I, I'm asking you for the criteria of a, of a good lawyer. Is it somebody- A lawyer who, in Georgia would be one, not one who's remote that's going to be in Connecticut, one that and, can and, actually and, sit and, across and, the and, table and, from you. And I have curiosity, and, why, why, is, why is it important that someone can sit across the table from you? Because we're talking about personal injury cases, making it personal. I just tried a case two weeks ago in Floyd County. Part of the reason I got the result that I did was because I went to the client's house multiple times. I sat down with her. I got to know her. I got to know her family. I got to know her neighbors. I got to know her friends. That, I knew is, what she had is, been is, through, is so that, I was able that, to be an advocate for her. So, so I think what one of the things that we're conflating is you're talking about the, the, the 1% of cases that are worth... Uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars uh, mm -hmm. instead of the 75% cases that are worth less than $30,000. And a lot of those cases have to be litigated too. Sure. You know, we, we routinely yeah. file cases. And so if an insurance company knows, well, this lawyer, that, 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 that point I agree with. So if they know this lawyer, and so that's, a, that's another criticism I have. There's something on your website that says most cases don't go to trial. That's true. That's true. But you that's need to be negotiating. You need to be negotiating in the shadow of the courthouse, not the shadow of a Zoom that. conference call from I, Connecticut. I, I, and that's the that's the that is the bottom line is yeah. you need an experienced Georgia personal injury attorney. So I think we have a fundamental disagreement. Uh, the vast majority of cases um, are basically insurance filings. Uh, and uh, 70, as I mentioned, 75 percent of cases uh, settle before. Um, oh, sorry, the, the vast majority of cases, well over 50%, settled before a lawsuit is even filed. Uh, that is macro data. That is not your firm. That's not Mighty Law. That's macro data. That is a lawyer helping with an insurance filing. And so those people who uh, are filing those sorts of cases, uh, they need a lawyer that uh, doesn't charge them an arm and a leg. Uh, they need lawyers who are transparent and their interests are aligned with their clients. Um, they need broader services than just legal help, uh, which a lot of lawyers uh, don't, don't do. I mean, they need, and they need transparency. Uh, and so to file uh, an insurance claim, um, I'm not really sure where the lawyer sitting has to do with anything. I know, for example, a lot of lawyers in Atlanta who take cases in Savannah. Um, so I, I think I, I broadly disagree with your premise uh, that, that you're trying to attack. So, Doc, I mean, everything that you've 
said here has confirmed my suspicions, though, about Mighty Law being a settlement mill. Because when you talk about the vast majority, let, let me finish. When you talk about the vast majority of cases settled before a lawsuit, what makes you think those cases should have settled and didn't deserve a lawsuit? If I have one criticism of the industry, I, it's that I, I it, let me finish. data from, from years and years and years. But what makes you think those cases were, were settled for full value? There are these, you're criticizing firms out here that you claim are unethical that are doing things improperly and they have misaligned incentives. How, how do you That's, know, but, but, my, but, but, that, but this is my question for you. How do you know when you look at a law firm and you look at lawyers that they are going to settle a case for full value? Is it more about the individual lawyer? Is it more about the firm and their policies? Like my, that's my question for you, which you haven't answered. Well, because I'm trying to get to the point because I think it's both. I, I think when you talk about cases settling, I think you're conflating cases going to trial versus cases that need litigation. You're giving examples of cases that can settle without a lawsuit being filed. And you're saying, well, more than 50% based on this macro, macro data settled without a lawsuit. That doesn't mean that those cases should have been settled. And, and, those and, cases and, should have gone into litigation. So they need to find lawyers who are not paper shufflers, who are in Georgia, who are willing to litigate their cases, who are willing to try cases. How does the consumer know that? So this is a couple of things. And I actually wrote down some criticisms of the industry because I knew you would ask me. So one of the criticisms I have of the industry is the noise. OK, so there's actually a lot of things you and I may agree on, despite the tone of this conversation. You know, uh, I for, for one and let me get slightly off topic, going back to something you said earlier, I totally disapprove of the practice of outsourcing the vast majority of your in-house operations and then expensing it to the client. So much so that we have things that ever like probably like even y'all would expense that we don't expense. Like I don't even charge for mileage unless I'm flying somewhere. OK, I, I am adamant and militant about not expensing I things. That, and I don't charge interest on my case expenses. It's dollar for dollar reimbursement. So you and I would probably agree on yeah. some things. I think we would disagree about how to fix it. And so with the advertising messaging. OK, and I want to make this clear for everyone. I'm not what a quote billboard lawyer. I don't have billboards up, okay? I have a website. So I think the the notion of advertising is different now than it was 20 years ago because of, of uh, digital technology, because of the internet. You know, any lawyer like Mighty has PPC ads. You know, I run PPC ads. Like we're all advertisers, right? So I think it's the media. What media are you using? But I think it's messaging. And I do think there's a problem sometimes with messaging um, in the personal injury world, because it says things to clients sometimes that aren't factors in that they should take into account when choosing a lawyer. And yeah. I gave you the example of cost. I mean, and I'm not saying cost isn't the only factor. What I'm saying is it should not be the predominant factor. It should be finding a lawyer who's competent, who gets good I, results. I, and, has and, a track and, and I agree with you on that. It, and so when we get to how can they find a lawyer who does those things, it is extremely hard. And I don't know personally how to fix it. If I did, I'd have a lot more cases probably and be hiring lawyers to work on them. Um, but th th this is the problem. If you go and search online, it's just a flood of data. OK, so the the Internet has been a double edged sword, right? It's it's leveled the playing field to some extent because people like me and you like we can go and put ads up even if we we can't get billboards. But there's so much noise there that it's hard for the customer to filter through that. I don't know how to fix that, but you know what so, I've typically told people is ask for referrals, ask people you know and trust. If you know a lawyer, ask them. Ask, uh, you know, do your research online, but do it in a deliberate way. Don't just hire the first lawyer that pops up on a on a click ad. So, so what should they, what should they look for? So let me but before before you answer that, um, we're almost at the or we are at the hour mark. Um, I think this is a great kind of topic, maybe five or 10 more minutes to end with. I can keep going. I don't have a hard stop till five. Yeah. But um, but because uh, because I think I think this is a this is a great topic, which is um, I 100 percent agree with uh, most of what you just said. Uh, I think, though, that the way that lawyers advertise is a proxy for the fact that people don't actually differentiate their services them, themselves. Um, and I think that's a, a, a bad thing for consumers 
uh, because ideally people would compete on factors that matter, not who holds the biggest hammer. They compete on things like if they can prove or show how they get their clients a better settlement. Uh, I totally agree with you that there are some lawyers who do a terrible job, uh, sometimes based on their own bad incentives, um, and some lawyers who do a great job. And I think that that is really important, it matters, and which is why we've handpicked our mighty law lawyers. Uh, I also think things like price matter, uh, although I will agree with you that it's less important than who the lawyer is. Uh, I also think the level and quality of service that they give. I saw a post where you talked about how your firm does uh, property damage, uh, and you were surprised at how few firms do that. I 100% agree with you. Uh, people are in car accidents. They need help getting their car repaired. And the vast majority of firms that we've seen don't even help with that because it doesn't help drive the settlement value up and they can't make money on that. And I think that's a shame. Uh, and, and competing on transparency. Um, and so those are the things that I think are really valuable for people to advertise on. But yet they don't. <laughs> But, but, but I try to do that, right? I mean, it's on my website. No, like, I, I, I don't want to make this about you. I, I actually yeah. was hoping that maybe we could use this last moment to be kind of constructive together and answer your question, which is like, you don't know how to do it. And maybe we can talk through like together how we can push the industry uh, to actually be more consumer friendly in their advertising and talk about things that matter to consumers as opposed to advertise on who can yell the loudest. So I think you're asking a good question. I mean, if you asked anybody in my situation who is not a, an advertising lawyer, and I just want to make something clear. I do not have any hard feelings at anybody that wants to be an advertising lawyer. Okay. It is not my business model. Um, it's not something that I want to do. It's not how I want to run my practice, but I have no problems if that's the way people want to structure their business model. I think it's the messaging that's key. I, I do think the, there's a lot of good messaging in Atlanta with some advertising lawyers. It's very professional. There's some that's over the top. I listened to FM radio a week ago, uh, every day driving into work. And I was shocked at the number of lawyer ads I heard on the radio, some of whom I had never heard of some of these lawyers before, but some of the claims being made in some of the, the ways that they presented that it's the free market. I, I don't think there's an easy way to say, well, like you, you can't, stop that speech because then you're running into first amendment considerations. No, there's no first amendment issues that you, we, of course we can stop the speech that we stop the speech by having people like you and me. Well, I'm talking about from a, from a bar perspective, I mean, sure, in terms of advertising, like you, you run into first amendment issues. That's why, you know, advertising used by, to be, by the way, I, I don't think the bar can solve any of these issues. I think it has to come from the free market and the free market absolutely can. And you and I can, this is the free market working you and you and me having this conversation. I think you and I can join link arms and say, these are bad practices. When Morgan and Morgan advertises all over Atlanta free, uh, that to me is a really bad message because there is nothing about personal injury that's free. Uh, and that to me needs to be called out. I called it out. Uh, and there was not one personal injury lawyer who would publicly stand with me and say, yeah, that is bad. That is deceptive. That is cunning. And I, I don't think it's the messaging. I mean, I'll tell you, I've heard people criticize that. I think people may not want to be associated with Mighty given the, the kind of way that Mighty came into the industry, to be honest with you. I, I And we could talk about that for another day, you know, maybe improving Mighty's uh, bedside manner uh, to some extent, if that's in the cards. But, um, you know, I think, you know, what I try to do, and this is all that I can do, Darrell Champion is an, a, you know, a personal injury attorney with four other attorneys is I can get my message out to people I know. I can get it out on LinkedIn. I can get it out on Facebook. That's what I try to do. That's why I called out the practice of lawyers sending every single client out to treat on a lien, which again, it, it is necessary in a lot of cases, but the client needs to be aware of it. And they need to make informed consent. That's something you and I would agree on, right? Um, bec but I, it has to come from, you know, one, I think members of the bar could do a better job of policing themselves. But at the end of the day, I can't make the lawyer who's going to make some outrageous claim on their billboard change their behavior, right? I can't. I, I, how can I do that? I, am by, I going to by, by actually calling them out and, and making them accountable in the public 
and amongst referral lawyers. And yeah, and I, I think you're ironically, under ironically, that is what we are being criticized for doing. The entire industry uh, is in their own silos, doing their own either good practices like a firm like yours or bad practices like so many other firms out there. And nobody is willing to actually call out bad behavior that hurts consumers. And when we come and do it, and we call out someone like Morgan & Morgan, we have people like you and many, many others who take exception with our tone, even though the substance of what we're saying is what is far more important. And so it's I, hard I, for, for I, other people then to follow us and to also say, yes, we agree, because they hear all of the criticism of us. Well, um, and they say, we don't want to be criticized because most people don't. I, I don't have a problem getting criticized. I'm not beholden to anybody, okay? My, and I didn't know that you criticized Morgan and Morgan for that. I think the criticism was people, in, in talking to colleagues of mine, felt like you were painting with a very broad brush. And I think anytime people paint with a broad brush, there's a tendency for people to push back on that and to, and to be upset about it. But, you know, getting to your point, I can call out the practices all day long on LinkedIn, on TikTok, YouTube, whatever. It's not going to change individual behavior. What, what I do and what I've strived to do is to educate the consumer. That is why my, my marketing strategy is information based. I have a ton of videos up on my website. We do videos regularly and I hope the clients find me. And if they can, great, I'm going to provide service. I'm going to distinguish myself from other lawyers. But the other thing is, if, if a client's considering other lawyers, I don't throw them under the bus. I don't tell them, hey, their business model is bad because they're a billboard lawyer or whatever. I differentiate myself. I say, you know what? This firm may do a good job for you, but here's the difference. My firm's smaller. We're going to give more of an in individual attention to you. And here's all the, the benefits you're, that you're going to get from our firm. I don't say like billboard lawyer bad. Don't hire you're, billboard you're, lawyer. You're, 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 you're parsing words. By, by you saying you're smaller and able to give more individualized attention, really what you're saying is, they won't give you individualized attention because they're big. And so again, I really think that what you're criticizing is tone. And I think it is really important that people like you and me and others do call out bad behavior that hurts consumers and calls people out sometimes by name. I know it feels uncomfortable and it might, it might feel mean, but that is how so much behavior in the world has changed. And I just believe very strongly that when you look at personal injury, nothing has gotten better in decades. And uh, something has to change. And so we are excited to try and promulgate that change. And if we have to do it by sometimes raising our voice or making people feel, making personal injury lawyers feel bad about themselves because we're speaking the truth that we have a unique insight on, then so be it. And I'm happy to be that, that villain but it is not, I think, in anyone's best interest to have people like you stand by and watch other people's bad behavior without calling it out, because I, I think calling it out does actually lead to them changing it. Josh, I have called it out. If you go to my LinkedIn profile, I called out the mass practice of, of people sending everybody out to treat on a lien without advising the client about it. I mean, I've called out plenty of practices. The problem is I'm one person. I'm not going to like you tried to take out a billboard to call out firms. I'm not doing that because I'm not going to advertise on billboards. That's my business model. I don't want to do it. We, 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 and, don't, we, we don't advertise on, on billboards either. Our, well, you tried to. No, no. Our, our, just to be clear, uh, uh, our billboards were uh, speaking the truth and exposing secrets that personal injury, uh, sorry, that billboard lawyers have. Uh, it was not targeted towards consumers. The billboards that we had envisioned, for example, didn't have a phone number. Uh, it didn't have a, a conversion website that it was linked to. Uh, they were trying to educate uh, like a public service announcement uh, to help consumers understand more about personal injury. That's what, that's what the, those were. Oh, e either way, my, my point is this. I'm not, and I don't have the capital because I'm not backed by venture capital, to go out and take out massive billboards calling people out. I am a small firm. I am doing my best to run my practice and represent my clients with the highest ethical standards and get them the best possible results. We take cases to trial. We push our cases to trial. Um, we file a lot of cases. I try to build relationships with other lawyers to be of service to their clients. But that's what I can do. I don't have the bandwidth to go out and, and be a so, mouthpiece so, for individual bad practices. But so, I, I think so we, so, so we do have those resources. And my question for you is, 
how can how can we do that better? How can we make sure that those bad practices actually change? Uh, well, by one, I would I I think calling out the bad practices and not firms. Because I think what you've done with the billboard lawyer character has created a false dichotomy for the consumer. Some there, so my, my criticism as a as a lawyer who likes to take cases to trial and litigate cases is there's too many settlement mills. Not all billboard firms are settlement mills, and not all settlement mills are billboard firms. And so when you look at that, when you've created a picture for the consumer that billboard lawyer bad, which again I'm not a billboard lawyer, so I'm, I have no incentive to be defending these people. And small firm lawyer over here, good you've created a false dichotomy in their mind. I think it's important to identify the individual bad practices so that the consumer can be on the lookout for them so that they can ask those questions when they are hiring people. Some of the most unethical lawyers that do things like using runners, I know a lot of people listening are lawyers, but runner people, firms that use runners, that's when they pay somebody to go out and solicit a car wreck victim not or other injury victim. Not only is it um, against the ethical rules, but it's against the law. It's an yeah. actual crime, 100%. but it, it happens. But the vast majority of firms do not do that. There can be a perception that a lot of firms do it, but, but the vast majority thing. of firms don't. But, but a lot of firms do you, which is that one of the reasons that people don't call out individual firms that do that is because those people fear that people are gonna call them out. And what it essentially results in at the end of the day is no one is, actually calling each other out on these sorts of problems uh, in a way that changes behavior because everyone is scared uh, that they're going to be they're going to be next. But in fact, in a thriving marketplace for any product or service, uh, there should be that sort of competition where people are actually saying this firm is doing this bad and uh, those firms then because of market forces change their behavior, um, I'll just share um, what I was talking about a, a second ago, um, which is um, on my on my Twitter, um, I called out Morgan and Morgan, um, calling out uh, for the people and John Morgan to stop using free unless you can explain what exactly is free and maybe introduce me to free clients. You got your free option, and there was not. And I posted this on LinkedIn, and there was not one personal injury lawyer. Um, that would that would join me, and you can make the excuse that no one wants to align themselves with Mighty, but I didn't even see people talk about it on their own platforms. Uh, so maybe you don't have a lot of followers. <laughs> um, no, maybe, seriously, I don't even know my Twitter uh, password, so you, I would have not have even seen I mean, this tweet. Not to put you on the spot, like, do you agree that uh, all these billboards that Morgan and Morgan has all across Atlanta uh, talking about free is actually uh, really cunning and misleading? I don't. And here's why. I, I, I don't think that a single person actually thinks that they're going to get their service for free because what it says is free unless we win. That's what their TV ads say, free unless we win. So I think to, you know, to call them out and say, well, this is misleading. I mean, look, if somebody's hiring them, think that they're actually getting and paying 0% fee. People do fee. think that, I promise you. Look, 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 look at this. When people find out our lawyers are free if we don't win, there's a huge line out the door. That is what people think. That is what consumers think. You might not uh, you might not realize that, but it is. But it says right there in the ad, free if we don't win. So, like, so, so, let, so let's talk about this. What could possibly be free? So a case that wins isn't free. A bad case that Morgan & Morgan rejects isn't free. A case that they thought was worth pursuing but couldn't win, is that what they're calling free? Is this what you think they're calling free? Just like, let, let's actually parse this for a minute. Um, what do you think they mean by free? Free means the client doesn't owe them anything if they don't win their case. What is the exactly client what get? It when, 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 when you get something for free, you actually get something. What does the client who's, who join, who signs up for Morgan & Morgan under this free unless you win, what do they actually get? They get a lawyer who represents them, who handles the claim for them. And, who, and I mean, and, look, and, there's and, every lawyer, every lawyer has lost a case, okay? And... I, the service I provide my clients, it doesn't mean that it wasn't there. It doesn't mean that it wasn't real. It doesn't mean that they didn't have somebody there walking them through the process and, and being a lawyer. It's kind of like saying, you know, if if a business litigation firm loses a business litigation dispute for a client, what does the client get? They still got the legal service, right? So, you know, I, I don't think the Morgan and Morgan ads are the problems. I think there's probably some bigger problems out here. And let me give you one. I don't remember the name of the firm, but there's a firm that, and I don't even know if it's on a billboard or if I saw it on Facebook once, that pushes pre-settlement loans on people. 
that advertises that they can get pre-settlement loans for people so quickly. And it shows like a guy in a wheelchair being pushed by a butler immediately after his injury case. And it shows the other person who went with a lawyer who didn't get him a pre-settlement loan. And it shows him like, you know, living in the poor house and he doesn't have any resources. That's a problem, okay? Because it's creating a, a one incentive for lawyers to hire or p- clients to hire this firm based off of the promise of a pre-settlement loan, which is ridiculous. Why? Two, any firm can get anybody a, Why? a pre-settlement loan. What's that? So, so can, can I finish my last point and then I'll tell you why. So, but the other problem is um, there is absolutely no reason that, lo- that clients should be factoring it, that into their equation. But the last reason is probably the thing you were going to ask me. It's generally bad for the client to get a pre-settlement loan unless they absolutely need it because these things have super high interest rates and it affects the client's ability to get their case resolved at the end of the case. And I know one of the things I, I, I had heard and read some of your stuff, like defending the pre-settlement loan industry when y'all were involved in it. And I guess you still are in terms of providing capital. And it was, well, it gives access to capital to people who need it and allows them to get to the end to get their case resolved. I've seen firsthand in representing a client, the negative effects of it. It absolutely does serve its purpose for clients who absolutely need it. But when it's going up and doubling, tripling for some places that have compound interest with no cap on it, it creates a disincentive to stick it out for the long haul because it's like, well, gosh, if I stick this out, my pre-settlement loan is going to go from 20 grand to 60 grand. I better yeah. take this settlement. Yeah. Whereas so, if, a, if a client doesn't have that, they don't have to worry about paying it back and, and they can stick it out longer. Yeah, I think this is like an incredibly, I'm not calling you this, but I think this is like an incredibly elitist sensibility that so many personal injury lawyers have that I fundamentally disagree with. Josh, so, I've been- but, 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 but let, me, let me finish. I, 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 I let you say your piece. I 100% agree with you uh, that high interest uh, loans are bad. Uh, I 100% disagree with you that giving people who just had a traumatic industry, uh, a traumatic injury, uh, that are amongst the 56% of Americans who can't come up with more than $1,000 in, uh, in the case of an emergency, a lifeline through financing in order to pay for rent while they're out of work, in order to pay for food, in order to pay for deductibles, in order for, to pay for medical treatment in some cases. Um, I totally disagree that that is not incredibly powerful. It is powerful. I, I never I, said I, it. I, what I, I said is when it's abused. No, but 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 I think the one of the things that we've done at uh, Mighty Law, uh, uh, sorry, one of the things that we've done at Mighty is that uh, we've uh, established this interest-free friends and family loans uh, that allow people to go to their friends and family, uh, and we help facilitate that uh, to be interest-free to allow them to get that capital um, without uh, without actually having to pay that high of interest. But even if a a person has to pay interest, that often might be the difference between them being evicted uh, from their house. And so to me, it is really just interesting that almost every personal injury lawyer has a loan. And in fact, we actually at Mighty uh, work with personal injury lawyers to help them get loans because we think that financing is important, something you brought up earlier. You're Um, financing these lawyers that have all these bad incentives? We are we are financing lawyers because one of the key ways in order to uh, realign their incentives is to give them lower and lower interest rates. But let's just put that aside for one second. It's my understanding that you're the capital you provide in the pre-settlement loan industry has some of the highest interest rates for pre-settlement loan companies. But let me come back to my point about pre-settlement loans. I never said pre-settlement loans were bad. I said they can be abused. And I was giving it in the context of the guy or woman, I don't remember who this law firm is, who's out there pushing it on people, who's showing you know, that you can get this money within 24 hours, it 100% gets abused. Now, I think the other thing is there's a touch it, of irony. It, does, it, the, it, 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 it definitely does get abused, to be clear. Right. And but, the reason, and, and the, yeah, go ahead. And, and by the way, I don't think that uh, law firms can or even ethically are allowed to incentivize people with money in order to sign them up. So that is a bad They're practice. not. But, you know, getting back to my point is, you know, the reason that we have an incentive that says or a rule that says lawyers can't pay part of the client's medical expenses on the front end is to prevent them from giving that incentive. And, and my position is Mighty is is making an in run around that by incentivizing it on the back end. But, you know, t- to mention the elite sensibilities, it is a touch of irony that the venture capital backed lawyer from New York is calling the lawyer, the personal injury lawyer who owns a small business in Georgia elitist 
Well, I, 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 I am simply reacting to you having your own loan for your law firms, which is collateralized by an interest, interest that you've gotten from personal injury clients and telling them uh, that they themselves can't get loans and that anybody- I never said that they otherwise. can't get loans. What no, I said was, what I said was, and, and being on the ground here and actually representing personal injury clients, I see how it gets abused is when people buy, take it out because they want to put new rims on their car or they want to go on yes. vacation or I, I, they want to do this. I, 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 that I, I, happens. And that's what I'm criticizing. But, the but vast majority of lawyers I know are okay with clients but getting that. To make a rule with the exceptions and the vast majority of the people- But that's what we're talking about here, right? They're literally paying their rent. They're we're, literally we're talking about rules and exceptions. We're talking about bad practices. And so my criticism is, you know, Mighty has come in and painted with a broad brush for exceptions. It's taken the exceptions. It's taken the bad apples and, and made it look like the whole bunch has that. And it doesn't, which again, I think may honestly may partly be due to, I, I, and I'm not criticizing you for this on like a personal level, but I do think it's, it's informed by your experience. If what you've, if the only sliver of the industry you've seen is from the medical funding. Well, and, you, 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 you said yourself that we've been providing software to the personal injury attorney industry where we have over a million cases for years. That's what has been informing right, us. Right, but it comes, but it is a software portal. It's a multifaceted uh, information that, that paints this, this picture for us. Let me just react and, 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 and just respond to what you just said. Uh, I do think that it is fair to paint a broad brush amongst all personal injury lawyers uh, or the vast majority of them for incentive misalignment. Let me give you one more example that you can react to. One of the things that is common that we've seen is that a client or consumer will come in uh, at the very beginning with an existing offer uh, that they have uh, from an insurance company to settle their case. And the lawyer uh, often inflates what they think they can get uh, for the client and results in the client signing because they think that they're going to be able to get a lot more money. Uh, and then what happens is the lawyer is not able to actually deliver on that. In fact, the lawyer comes um, a month later, three months later, a year later and says, we think that you should settle for at or close to uh, what they originally offered you when you first came in. And yet the lawyer will still make their third or whatever their fee is. And the client often nets less than they would had they never hired that lawyer to begin with. Now, that is easily remedied uh, by having a policy uh, amongst a law firm like Mighty Law has that says that if a client comes in with a real offer, the client will never be worse off by hiring Mighty Law. That is uh, very rare in personal injury day. There are a handful of firms that we've seen that do that, but the vast, vast majority don't. And so that is a fair uh, criticism that people have the wrong incentives and that if they only had a policy like Money Law did, uh, that those incentives would be, would be realigned. So what is wrong with me pointing that out, uh, even though it's generally applicable to everybody? So it's not generally applicable to everybody. I mean, the idea that, that we don't all have it on our website doesn't mean we don't do it. I have said that exact thing you said, a client will not be worse off for hiring me. You have it in your retainer agreement? Times. When I, so I have a, a retainer agreement that when a client comes to me, if they already have an offer where we have the percentage, I will put after it 30% of the amount retained. We will type in there above, let's say it's a $10,000 offer, above $10,000. And we only charge a fee above what the existing settlement offer is. But I will tell you this too. I, 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 I love that. Wait, wait, stop. wait let's, just, let's just stay here. I love that. I'm really happy to hear you do that. Would you, would you be surprised to learn that most personal injury law firms don't have that in their retainer? So let, let, can I mention one, two things really quick. I, the, the majority of people I know engage in that practice, whether they put in their retainer agree, agreement or not, don't take a fee on an existing offer, number one. But number two, I have had many times where somebody's come and told me they had an offer and they didn't. So sure. guess what? If I put it into the retainer agreement, so I always verify now. I, I agree. Because th verify. there are people, <laughs> and I would encourage you all to as well, who will come and say, well, the insurance company offered me $10,000. And you call I, the insurance company and they're like, we never offered anything. Or here's what's very common they'll confuse the policy limits with an offer. 
Well, they told me they were giving me $25,000. We never offered her $25,000. The wreck was just three days ago. We don't even know what her treatment is. We told yeah, her the policy limits. So, so, I, so I, I agree people people can sometimes make up things. But but this is where I think you've only seen a sliver of the industry where the people you know sometimes do this. Uh, we've seen a much larger swath. Um, and this is incredibly rare amongst personal injury lawyers. But, but regardless, do you agree that you'll stand with me um, when I put out a video like I did on the one that you critiqued? And say, if you are a consumer and you have a bona fide written existing offer, uh, you should not hire a personal injury lawyer unless they are willing to not charge you a fee unless they're able to actually make you better off. And give that advice to consumers. I'm happy to give that advice. When you say stand with you, I don't know if you mean literally or figuratively. No, I don't mean, I don't mean literally. I mean I'll, figuratively. I will figuratively stand with and, you. And, and, and so I, all I'm saying, and I think this is a great place for us to end because we're not now at 90 minutes. All I'm saying is that is one example uh, that we are aligned on. That is a really good practice that most personal injury lawyers don't do, but that if the industry had more conversations like this, we could get to more of this common ground, which I think is great. Um, in order to say, here are some of the best practices that aren't ethically required by the bar, but are things that uh, we would tell our best friend if they were looking for a personal injury lawyer to make sure that they got in the retainer agreement of the lawyer they hired. Sure. Is that a question? Yeah. The question is, do you agree that there are more things that you and I can do together going forward and that personal injury lawyers can do in general to take some of these best practices and try and make sure that more personal injury lawyers embody them in order to protect consumers? So with a caveat, I, I am fine to be the loudest voice for calling out bad practice again, like I've done before. Will I be associated with Mighty Law? No, I won't, because I, I don't think that some of the things that y'all have done are fair or, or are pro-consumer. But I, I do think there is some common ground in terms of these things that we've identified. I just, and I want to end on this note, the vast majority of people I know are good hearted personal injury lawyers. They are doing this because they want to help people. That's why, you know, when people ask me, why do you do what you do? It's because I want to help people. That's why. And so when we are accused of doing things improperly or having misaligned incentives that makes it seem like that, there is going to be pushback. I do think bad practices need to be called out. I do think that there are certain firms that do it, but I also think it's wrong to create a false dichotomy between billboard lawyers and non-billboard lawyers. Because that, that I think, creates a, a misimpression in the client's mind that, well, if I just don't go with the billboard lawyer, I'll be okay. And yeah. they could get totally fleeced by a non-billboard lawyer. Again, I would come back to some of the most unethical practices that I've seen, like the, the, the practice of using runners. Most advertising firms don't use runners, to my knowledge, because they don't need to. They're advertising. Do some of them? Maybe. Do some lawyers within those firms? Maybe. But it's a shifty practice that's hard to peg. And it, it's why it's very, very hard to enforce those laws. The police you have other problems to worry about. So is Darrell Champion is a attorney who's trying to, you know, support his employees and, and, and work on his clients cases. And, you know, I have kids and I have a wife and I have all these things that I'm, I'm trying to be, I can't stop that practice. I can call it out. I can say, you know, I think we have a video on our website. Like if, a, if you get a call from somebody soliciting you after an accident, run the other way. And I'll continue to do that. Yeah. And but I, I also that, intend to defend. Training. I don't need you or anyone else to retweet uh, the, the things that we say. But I do think uh, it is worth creating more pressure in the industry in order to encourage uh, or sometimes even force through education people to change their practices. I also will just end where I started and say, uh, I have a lot of close friends who are personal injury lawyers. I, I don't think personal injury lawyers um, are, are bad people, but I do stand by uh, believing very strongly uh, that good people within systems that have the wrong incentives, and I do believe that a lot of uh, systems in personal injury have the wrong incentives, lead to uh, bad behavior. And one of the things uh, that I'm excited to do in the months and years ahead um, is to push the industry to change those incentives. And if there's nothing else that you and I can agree to on this call, there's at least one, one incentive around having an early offer. When you come into a firm, the client shouldn't be worse off 
Um, and I'm glad that we can kind of align on that. And I look forward to continuing uh, this dialogue and other dialogues um, in, in the future. Thank you for doing this. Thanks, Josh. And again, thank you for having me. Um, I, I think and I hope it was a constructive conversation. Um, I, I hope I didn't say anything uh, in, no. inappropriate. I'm passionate about what I do. I'm passionate about our profession and the people we help and, and the good people that are in it. So um, it, it can come across sometimes as, as a little uh, passionate and, and loud sometimes. But I again, it's coming from a good place. So I appreciate well, the conversation. I, well, 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 I, 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 I hope you'll I hope you understand that that exact same caveat applies to me over the last two months. Take care, Josh. Thank you. Take care.